three years, actually, in Nurcam, I've been in Polytechnic for more than 10 years. That, don't worry. Uh, so can less teaching bring more learning? Good for the live, this is live feed, right? No. <laughs> uh, a slight change in the subtitle, though, but same message. But before I start, please, I ask you, get up and stretch, please. <laughs> Almost three hours of sitting down, my back is killing me. So go ahead and stretch, stretch, stretch it out, please. Feels good, doesn't it? Uh, on the side also. I said, breathe in. All right. Good, good, good. Excellent. I don't know. I don't think I'll, I'll take half, more than half hour. I hope I won't. So is the title just provocative or just stating what is now obvious to every instructor uh, in higher education? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I, I don't know you, so I'll, I'll, I'll just guess that for some of you, yes, this is uh, something normal. Uh, we should be teaching less <laughs> for uh, having more uh, learning happening. So if you're in the learning business, the first question you should ask yourself is, what is learning, right? What is learning? Uh, how does it occur? When and where does it occur? Uh, we have seen many presentations on where the uh, learning is occurring now, and it's not in the same places where it used to be when we were uh, studying, right? And how do, we, uh, how do we know that it has occurred? So Susan, uh, Susan Ambrose and her colleagues uh, identified three critical components associated with learning, right? First one is it's a process, it's not a product, but we only have access to a product when we ask them to do things, right? That's how we know if they learn or not. The second thing is you need to have a change. So a change between the first day when they come in your class or when they're sitting in your class or whatever they are when you're teaching them and the end of the semester, change in knowledge, behavior, attitude, anything. So you need that delta. Uh, and it has to be lasting. So it's not a fleeting, but something that should be there for a long term, right? So usually, well, at least those who understand the system, we learn, but mostly for short term, and we tend to forget very quickly, right? So does it really, uh, ha does uh, learning have has happened there. And the third one, for me, is the most important one, is learning is not something done to students, but rather something students themselves do. So keep this in mind during this presentation. Okay, uh, a few uh, questions. Is teaching equivalent to learning? So uh, uh, in parentheses, instructor talk talking, right? This is teaching. Is listening uh, equivalent to to, to learning, so listening to instructor talking. Maybe, maybe not. <laughs> Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> yeah, maybe, <coughs> maybe. Uh, now, my next question, what do we call the thing the man in the picture is doing? So let me bring you back the picture, and this is the man I'm referring to. I heard it, lecturing, I, I, I heard it, I heard it. So lecture, lecture, right? So if you look it up, and I, I did look it up in one of those <coughs> online dictionaries, the American Heritage Dictionary, right, it's online. So it can be, uh, a lecture can be a noun or a verb, right? So, and, and I'm hoping I'm using the first definition, not the second one, unless you feel like I should uh, reprimand you at the end of this talk, right? But I'm referring to the number one definition. So it's an exposition of a given subject delivered before an audience. A little bit what I'm doing right now and what we heard examples before me. My next question, where does the term lecture come from? Who knows? You don't talk. She's from Montreal, so she speaks French. I don't want her to answer. She's my student, my master's student. 
but who can tell me, where does the term lector come from? Latin, okay, so we have someone saying Latin, but what? Hmm? Is it? Ah, okay. All right, so, yeah, it comes from the French, uh, lecture, right? So let me point from Middle Eng English, act of reading. Lectura. You tried some Latin, right? There you go. The past participle of lecere, to read. You get my picture, right? That's what it means. Lecture comes from the word lecture. In French, it means to read. That's what it means. My, my next question, why should we continue lecturing uh, in the era of technology and information availability. Why? I don't think so. <laughs> but I, I am not against anything, right? I am open to everything, and probably lecture still has a small place in this business, but I hope not the biggest place. Uh, why change how we train our students? So there's a few uh, reasons there. You probably already know these reasons, and there may be even more reasons that I haven't thought about. But of course, all this is impacting, and not only the learning business, it's impacting all businesses, right? So I'm going for a, an image here. You, you probably know this saying, right, about the hungry person, don't give them a fish, uh, you should instead teach them how to fish, right? Everybody knows this. Now, how to conciliate proper professional training and this exponential knowledge of growth? So if I continue with my fish metaphor, we can think about knowledge as being that fish. But that's not enough, right? If we want him or this person to be able to catch his own fish, well, we should teach him how to master that skill of catching fish. And then we should probably try to see if he is good at doing it. So how long will it take him to catch a fish? Or will he know which little um, kind of bait to put on to catch the fish, or all this knowledge that he needs to know. And probably our uh, salvation comes from this fourth part, which is the lifelong learning. So teach them how to learn, right? And that will make him autonomous for the rest of his life. So if, if we're talking, I don't know if there are many people from education field here, I try to put this uh, in their language. They call this declarative knowledge. So this is all facts, you know, everything you need to know about a subject. And then trying to master the skill, well, that has to do more with the procedural knowledge, how to do things, right? And then the competent performance probably has to do with the conditional knowledge. And this is something I find that we don't teach a lot, or at least we don't give a lot chance students to work on the conditional knowledge. When should I go to fish? How, uh, what should I put on the end of that little uh, rope that I have there to catch? So all the conditions that allow me to use my procedural knowledge and my declarative knowledge, and then, uh, to be able to stay competent all my life, I will need this more metacognitive knowledge. To know if I know, to know if I don't know, to know if I did something well, and if I, or if I didn't, or I haven't, or how can I make it better? So this is the metacognitive, and this also we can provoke and uh, teach our students to have that reflex. Most of them don't. Unfortunately. 
So three points I want to make this afternoon. Three points. First one is learning is, is facilitated when the context and object of learning makes sense to the learner. And I will probably echo a lot from the first presentation uh, uh, through uh, these three points. Innovation and technology, while very appealing to some, make sense when they leverage pedagogy. And the third point is active learning pedagogies uh, have proven more efficient for learning. So, number one, learning is facilitated when the context and object of learning makes sense to learner. About two years ago, I read a piece of news on yahoo.ca, so that's <laughs> Canadian Yahoo, right? Uh, maybe you've seen this news, uh, it probably went around the world. Lego, one of the biggest toy companies on earth, owes its turnaround to a child skateboarder. So that intrigued me, and I went to read, what's it all about? So this is directly from excerpts from that article. And you can read, in the early 2000s, the Lego group was hemorrhaging uh, money and sifting through reports that creative toys faced an agonizing death in the digital era. However, in 2015, the Danish toy maker uh, net profit rose 31% over previous year. And with 5.3 billions uh, in sale, the company uh, was now challenging Mattel as the world's largest toy company. So what happened between 2000 and 2015? What did their marketing agents discover? Well, they did not use big data, right? They did not look into that. They actually looked at uh, what the user liked. The little data. The little data. <laughs> so this boy, this 11-year-old boy from Germany, uh, he liked Legos, so he played uh, with Legos, but he also liked to skateboard. So when they were uh, asking him questions, so what do you like about Legos and why do you play, or not even Legos, like, what do you enjoy playing with? What do you like? And he started to show, him, to show them his skateboard. This is not the actual skateboard, right? It's just a picture I found on Google. Thank you, Google. I don't need you, Google because my wife knows everything, by the way. <laughs> but I still use Google. So he was telling them, look, look, this is where uh, I have a scratch on my, on my skateboard. This is uh, where my shoes are worn. And that is exactly the same place where the professionals worn their shoes. So he was very proud to show them that. So they, they, they figured it out. Digital era or not, kids still care deeply about mastering a skill and being able to show off the evidence of their work. The company began creating bricks, uh, brick kits uh, for girls and boys uh, that were uh, more and more complicated. The challenge uh, uh, was uh, bigger, so the bricks became smaller, more specialized, uh, it became a lot more complicated to play with Legos. But finishing an intricate Lego set uh, like the 3,800 piece uh, Death Star gave kids a satisfying <coughs> sense of achieve achievement. And you can read about the small data. So the book, uh, I think was a, a bestseller, uh, is available from Martin Lindstrom. So what role do instructors and, and pedagogy play in the learning process? Well, we have to first think of creating a proper atmosphere for learning. Have students take ownership of their learning and the trick part, the tricky part is trust that they will do it. Because that's not part, 
it's not here, it's here. <laughs> to feel that we can trust and they will be responsible for their learning. So active learning pedagogies tap into those elements. Uh, there are two essential conditions to be considered as active learning, only two. Not very difficult, right? The first one is students must do an activity other than listening to teacher talking and taking notes. That's the first condition. And anyone can guess the second condition? Must be what? Uh huh. Yeah, very close. Must lead to a skill. Solve a pro any problem? Something relevant to this course, right? So it has to be related. It has to be related. Oh, and by the way, this activity. How this happened through uh, this uh, expression of hands-on learning. Have you heard of hands-on learning? And people interpret that as, oh, my students have to touch something. They have to be doing something. No. It, it can be only up here. It can be happening. They're doing something, but it's ha we don't see it, but it's happening, right? And the second has to be related to uh, the course concepts, materials, or learning goals. So there you go, two conditions. You fulfill that and you have active learning with your class. Yes, we are aiming for high student engagement in, acti uh, 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 in active learning. It can be behavioral, emotional, or cognitive uh, engagement, right? And those three are somehow related to, uh, to each other, but this is what uh, is important for active learning that student engagement. He has to be thinking about, he has to be discussing, he has to be asking questions. Uh, this is active learning. One question. When I asked you to get up and move and stretch, is that considered to be active learning? It doesn't cover what? Uh, because <coughs> what is behavioral is is actually kind of happening in most of the behavior we use. But it wasn't happening. So you wouldn't consider it that as an active learning activity? It wasn't related to what we were talking about. It wasn't related. Exactly. So probably not. Is this considered to be active learning? The question asked the fact if that was active learning or not. That would be. So it did help me a little bit. And it relieved you, right? Tension in the back. Other valuable lesson uh, from the gaming industry. Uh, this is interesting. Uh, make it progressive and control complexity. That's interesting because if you're uh, working with students in the first year, uh, f when they, they, they just start, so they don't have so much knowledge yet. Well, why not put them in situations where they have to think and they have to solve problems, but you can control the complexity. And we, we can do that. We can take away variables and say, don't worry about the environment, don't worry about the budget, don't worry about this, but you have this problem and try to think about it. So th if, we, if we have this progressive, to be able to gain that autonomy that he needs to eventually go and be able to do it on his own, right? So this, uh, we probably need a program approach. Program approach where teachers, instructors, faculty members talk to each other about what they're doing in the class, why they're doing it like that. 
I don't know if you have a lot of many chances to talk with your colleagues about these things. Certainly not where I work. Um, so it's something to think about. Number two, innovation in technology, while very appealing to some, makes sense when they leverage pedagogy. So a few couple of questionable scenarios. The first scenario, take a few moments to look at this, I'll move out of the way. <laughs> I don't know if you have seen this picture before. It's been around for a while now, but. So this is, uh, people say to me, well, I have to use technology because students like technology. Sir, go ahead, use it, of course. How are you gonna use it though, right? That's the whole point. How are you gonna be using it? Second scenario. I don't. No, uh, I wasn't born then, so a few of you were born, you can probably validate this, but urban legend has it that during the space race in the 60s, NASA spent millions to develop a pen that would write in zero gravity. So they bragged about it to the Soviet cosmonauts, and of course, they rolled back their eyes and saying like, yes, we also thought about this problem, but we just decided to use pencils. <laughs> So, and this is the actual pen, I think. I found this on, on, on the internet, so it, it seems like something engineers would do. I work with engineers a lot. I'm not an engineer, but I love engineers. So yes to innovation, yes to technology. However, being creative in a useful manner can be just as efficient, pedagogically speaking. Right? So. If you think you w will invest in that program or that software or whatever technology you need and you think will help your students, go ahead and do it. But sometimes even low tech can be just as efficient, right? So something to think about. Number three, active learning pedagogies have proven more efficient for learning. If you're wondering uh, what I'm talking about, I've put in three categories, uh, examples of active learning methodologies. So you have uh, what I've put, the first category, interactive learning, uh, inquiry-based learning, and uh, the third one, experiential learning. So interactive learning emphasizes on engaging the students in thinking, discussing, evaluating ideas. So you have a few examples, peer instruction, think, pair, share, group discussions, debates, concept questions, team-based learning, all these fall into that category. Of course, they're not exclusive, mutually exclusive, but uh, usually these are more uh, short period of time. So you can do it for five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, right? Uh, the second category, inquiry-based learning, this probably takes a little bit more time maybe two, three hours or a little bit more. So uh, engages students directly in manipulating, applying, analyzing, problem-solving activities. Problem-based learning, case studies, research projects, lab experiments are examples of uh, these uh, methodologies. And the third category, the experiential learning, uh, where students take on roles that simulate professional practice. So the project-based learning is something very uh, used in, in engineering um, uh, programs. You have, of course, simulations, role-playing, service learning, gamification. We're not very, uh, in Canada, we don't use a lot of service learning. Uh, I know a few places and uh, I've read uh, about a few experiences, but a lot in Latin America. So I, I work with uh, uh, many Latin American countries and there is very, very popular. Maybe in the US as well and maybe other countries. <laughs> Five minutes, wow, I never thought I would go with that. S here are a few, uh, probably you know, uh, you know uh, these um, uh, studies, but Freeman I think is one widely now um, uh, talked about where they did a meta meta 
analysis uh, of two over 200 studies, and they found that higher student engagement uh, it, uh, brings a decrease in the failure rate. So it helps all the students, not only the not so strong ones or the strong, all the curb, all, all, everybody moves uh, when the teacher uses active learning pedagogies. Uh, with my colleague, uh, Jean-Francois Desbiens, uh, we also found that active learning methods uh, bring higher student motivation and engagement. Um, oh yeah, so this was in STEM. Uh, Freeman, uh, all the studies were in STEM. Uh, we looked at engineering uh, students. Uh, Lassander and Harmson found uh, performance success and learning outcomes also uh, were positive with uh, active learning pedagogy. Uh, Benoit Rossin uh, from Europe and his colleagues uh, found that helps for pro uh, complex problem solving. And uh, Weimer uh, with uh, mathematics found a change in attitudes of students towards mathematics and their performance as well. So, you know, two positive things there <laughs> with active learning pedagogies. Um, there. So I can conclude just reminding you the three points I was trying to make today. Learning is facilitated when the context and object uh, of learning makes sense to learner. Innovation and technology, of course, can help, uh, but make sense when they leverage pedagogy. And uh, inquiry-based active or any active learning uh, have proven more efficient for learning. I'm done. Thank you.